back to 2 Corinthians tonight, 2 Corinthians chapter 8. I'm going to do my best. I think I'm going to get through 8 and 9 tonight uh, because they're both, both very similar, so I want to try to get them lumped into one so that way we're not covering sort of the same topic two weeks in a row. I mean, the Holy Spirit does differently tonight, and we'll, we'll only do one chapter. Uh, I was going to try to cover... Um, since Sister Kayla had called me earlier and said, let me know that you know, all the ladies would be out here tonight. Uh, I'm hoping I have enough time to. I wanted to throw a little bit about that wall first mentioned in. I mentioned uh, last Wednesday night. Give you guys something real brief on that if I get time. I'm just There's just so much in here and never enough time to give it all it feels like. But praise the Lord for giving us a place to come and hand it out and, and then absorb it. So I'm thankful for that. Amen. 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 Um, it's been just long enough that I don't really remember what we dealt with, men, last, uh, the last chapter in Corinthians. Let me look back here. Uh, Paul commends them and talks about the good report he got about them. Uh, tonight, we're going to really look at two main topics in both chapters. There'll be a little bit outside of those we'll deal with, um, but really the big concept is giving. Uh, that giving any way, shape, or form can be looked at by money. It can be looked at by your service. I mean... Um, some preachers don't like saying nothing to people about giving, but Scripture tells us we're to give. And so um, I, it don't bother me what's in here. I'm going to preach it, and you'll do what you want with it, and the Lord will deal with you how he wants to deal with you. None of that bothers me. But um, nevertheless, we'll look and see what the Lord says about giving tonight. We'll look at a few other things uh, on the outskirts of that and in between. So 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 1, Paul says, Moreover, brethren, we do you to wit of the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia, how that in, great, that in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded under the riches of their liberality. For to their power, I bear record, yea, and beyond their power, they were willing of themselves. And I'll give you some of my the study notes I've got in my study Bible and some other thoughts that I broke down here. Um, but th this study note here would be relatively old. But I want you to look at this in dealing with verse 2. It says, half the world at this time, 3 billion people, live on less than $2 a day. Now, I don't know how many years ago this study note, this particular note was put in, but live on less than $2 a day. Almost a billion people don't have enough money to learn, to read, or write. About 790 million people don't have enough to eat on a regular basis. Over a billion don't have, an adequate, ac have adequate access to water. And 2.6 billion lack basic sanitation. 30,000 children die each day due to poverty. That's 11 million children under five years old each year. These are, there are a bunch of spoiled, rich, spoiled American Christians who will have a lot, to, for, to, a lot for which to answer for at the judgment seat of Christ. And I think that's a very powerful study. Now, we are in an age um, where people have a lot of money. And uh, I'm not about handing it to people that don't want to do for themselves. Everyone knows my stand on that. The Bible says if a man won't work, he shouldn't eat, right? We, we all agree with that. Um, but, but there is some things that could be taken care of uh, um, from a church standpoint. We, we've got churches that's got millions of dollars just sitting in a bank account, and I'm over here trying to figure out what we can do to help people out and trying to count our pennies and make sure that we can stay afloat. You say, well, you got to have faith. Well, yeah, you're also supposed to use your brain, too, especially with God's money. Amen? Amen. Uh, we don't get to just throw it at anything we want and expect God to do. Just just take care of us because we know that it doesn't work like that. We're called to be good stewards with what we've been given. And that means us using our head and saying, okay, so what I do when people need help, I make a phone call to the treasurers and I, I say, what's the count look like? Then I bring it to the church. Um, usually it's always something very small. But the, what I'm saying is it's frustrating to me because I know of churches in this county that can do abundantly above far more than we could ever do. And and, and yeah, if this sounds like bragging, I don't know how to tell, tell you otherwise when it comes to this church. We do our best to help people out that need it. Yep. Sure. And, and I see a lot of churches that don't care. They, they ain't right. got no concern. They're trying to figure out how they're going to pay off that new fancy building. They're trying to figure out how they're going to pay for this. And maybe their pastor makes six figures a year. I don't know all the answers to that, but this I do know. Churches are not hurting for money in America tonight. Now, there's some smaller ones, some, some that are uh, filled with people that aren't rich class like this, I, that, that, that are not doing the best financially. But there's more churches that have more millions than they know what to do with, and it just sits around. And what, what Ruckman was saying in his study note is you've got all these people, and he, he ends up narrowing it down to what he's really dealing with. 
You've got 30,000 children that die each day due to poverty, and that's 11 million children under five years old each year. Now, you, you've lost your mind if you think God ain't going to have you give an account of that if you're a millionaire, if your church is worth millions of dollars, and you've let stuff go uh, and never give a care or concern about it. Amen? Amen. Now, I, I don't know how you all feel about that, but I think that's good sense. A, a church, And we'll, we'll look at this stuff. Uh, I'm going to try to move as brief as I can, but Paul's going to deal with that, with, with the giving and being uh, frugal, but also giving liberally and, and, and helping people out and doing what you can. Now, as I said, someone, yeah. Is that in the world or in the United States? Uh, this it starts with half the world is the first okay. quote. So, uh, And I don't know how old this note is, so you can figure... But, but here's the deal. If they were living on less than $2 a day then, even if that number was $5 a day, it would be the same as the $2 back then because of inflation. Yeah. I mean, it wouldn't really change anything. But uh, what I'm telling you is it, it's just amazing. If you ever drive by and look at churches and see all the thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars, if God ever gives us the ability to build a church unless you all overthrow me and push me out of the way, it's going to be a metal building with the cheapest of cheap that can go in there, mm -hmm. something that keeps the rain and the cold and the heat the heat in and the cold out right. and, and the cold in during the summer month. That, that's all a church building needs to be. It doesn't need to be nothing extravagant. I mean, right. when you look at the Old Testament, yeah. yes, the tabernacle, uh, it had fine linen and all that stuff. Then you dealt with the temple, and it was very beautiful and magnificent. Uh, but, but there's no call in the New Testament anywhere for a church. And, and like we've said before, New Testament church at first, their first running on the ground was meeting in houses, meeting in places. And, and thank God we live in a nation where we're not on the run. We've got, we can assemble in a building, but there's no need for all the, the, the glamour and stuff. I, I, I don't get all that. Now, uh, a man that pastors and he does that, he'll give an account, not me. I'm not saying he's uh, going to be in big trouble. I, I can't really back that one way or the other with the scripture, but what I can back is that if you hold out when you've got all kinds of money, there's an issue there. God's not going to be very pleased with that. Uh, and also, in verse 2, uh, here's another note. This is not a prosperous church giving to a church in a third world country on the mission field. This is a poor church on the mission field giving back to the home church. Um, and just, a, just some food for thought. Uh, but I want to give you what Ruckman said he dealt with in, in regards to something along that thought here. Um, he said that they, they used to give to this church. Um, it was a missionary. He went to leper colonies in Thailand and, and, and reached a bunch of them, witnessed one a bunch, and he said they, they got a hold of his church at Christmas time and wanted to know if they could give them a gift. And he, uh, he said they asked, well, here was the gift they wanted. They asked us to send them our special prayer requests so they could pray for our specific needs. That's a, that's a heck of a gift you want, brethren. Right. You ever know of any of American people that say, hey, we want a gift for Christmas, and what the gift is is for you to tell us what kind of need you've got in, in, that we can pray for to help you out. And, and I'm going to give you the last one he says here. I at one time had correspondence with a, uh, a, a prisoner in a federal prison. He made 25 cents a day, which was equivalent to $91 a year. He wrote me because he made so much money and wanted to tithe to a church. He asked me to recommend a missionary he could support. That. You, you don't see that kind of attribute or attitude in the American culture today in all, virtually anybody. This guy had $91 a year, and he made he had so much money is what he told him. He wanted to tie it to something, to someone, to a missionary uh, for God's work. Now, you, you tell me if we're in that ballpark anymore or if we're, we're in the ballpark of how we can get more for ourselves and not really worry about anybody else. And that's uh, I, I, I don't have any complaints as a pastor in this area. But I'm just telling you, we got to watch it. we got to be careful with what we do with what God's given us because we're going to give an account for that one day. We're, we're gonna, God's going to want to know what we did with that. Uh, I, I Personally, I'm just telling you this personal testimony. I struggled real bad about me and her getting the side by side. You can ask her. I, it bothered me. I didn't want to do it for at times and times I wanted to, and I didn't want to. And I thought well, part of it's you know your own pride. You think, well, preacher gets something new, and he's going to hear never hear the end of it. Darren Stennett. Uh, had told me something like that along those lines. But uh, I just think of times of money that I, I spent on something that I don't need. It's just a luxury, something that I don't have to have. And I think, man, what could have God done with that money if I just give it away? Now, I know some people are pious and more spiritual than me. Well, God wants you to have nice things too. I, I don't need to hear all that. I know that it's okay for us to have things. I'm aware of that. But I'm the type of person, when I do purchase something like that, it, it takes me a few days to get over it. I'm like, man, what could have the Lord done with that money? And some days I still beat myself up over it, especially when the first payment comes due. 
You're thinking, why did I even do that? Well, that's stupid. Why did I even do that? And uh, as I said, there's nothing wrong with having stuff. God ain't mad that you, you work a hard job and you, you get yourself something like that. There ain't nothing in the world wrong with that scripture. There ain't, there ain't no, no, no call to get down on yourself, but I just do because I know how much money I waste besides those things. Amen? Amen. Like, I'm talking gas station trips, things of that nature. It's just a waste of money. I know that. And, and we're in the age of convenience stores and all that. Just a waste of money. And, and I think, man, what could I have done with that? And I'm not telling you that to beat yourself up. I'm just giving you personal testimony. I try to be aware and try to be alert and try to discern and say, <laughs> no, nah, I need to hold back and not. I mean, I could do something different with this money. Uh, but nevertheless, I fail just like everybody else in here. But I'm just telling you, we are going to give an account for what God's given us. Whether it be finances, whether it be talents, Talent. Amen. 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 God giving you a good talent to do something and you don't use it, he's going to want to know why you didn't use it. Right. Verse 3, For their power I bear record, yea, and beyond their power they were willing of themselves, praying us with much entreaty that we would receive the gift and take upon us the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. And this they did, not as we hoped, but first gave their own selves to the Lord and unto us by the will of God. Um, a lot of this can be self-explanatory. That's why I feel like we can... Um, probably get through both chapters, insomuch that we desired Titus, that as he had begun, so he would also finish in you the same grace also. Therefore, as ye abound in everything, in faith, and utterance, and knowledge, and in all diligence, and in your love to us, see that you abound in this grace also. What grace is Paul talking about? The grace of giving. We're going to look at that concept uh, here again, um, verses 10 through 15, that, that the grace is, uh, there's a relation between grace and giving. There, there's, there's, a, there's a thought process to that. And Paul says, you abound in this, you abound in that, you abound, abound in knowledge, you abound in faith, you abound in utterance, you, you abound in everything. And he says, and in all diligence and in your love to us, see that you abound in this grace also. He's saying, when you abound in all these things, you need to also make sure that you abound in that grace of giving, being uh, a giver, being a cheerful giver. We'll look at that too if, I, if the Lord allows me to get through both chapters. He says in 7, Therefore, as ye abound in everything, uh, I already read that, sorry. Verse 8, I speak not by commandment, but by occasion of the forwardness of others, and to prove the sincerity of your love. Uh, let me look here, see if I had anything wrote down I wanted to do. Uh, verse 9, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be rich. And so Paul talks about the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, in heaven, coming down here, being made in likeness of flesh, being uh, tempted in all ways like you and I, having nowhere to lay his head at night, having no having no pillow right. I mean, he said foxes have dens and so on and so forth, but the Son of Man hath nowhere to lay his head. I mean, he, he came down here and took on the life of a poor servant, and he says he did that, that we might be made rich. Now, I'm going to, I'm going to, I guess this is my, about as far as my prosperity preaching goes in my calling. You, you all tonight, if you're saved, you're the wealthiest people in this county. Amen. Um, and you say, well, I don't feel like it because we're always making it. That's because you're, you're focused. I'm always telling you about your eyes. Your focus is always down here mm -hmm. and you're looking around what they got, what they don't got, and what, what you don't have and what you wish you had and this and that. And we're all guilty of doing that. That's called indoctrination from American culture. That's what we are indoctrinated to do is never be satisfied with what we've been given. Amen? Amen. Amen? That's why you have commercials like you have commercials. That's why you have stuff that breaks in half the, two months and you got to turn around and throw it away and get something new because of whatever reason it costs more to fix it than it does to get whatever it is. It's always a continual thing to keep you unhappy and dissatisfied mm -hmm. and unsatisfied and never content. That is an American problem tonight. Amen. I don't know about you parents, but when Mike Hutzel came and talks about and talked about the kids and Sister Brenda talked about the kids and her Brenda's breadbasket deal, I said, they, I, man, I was mad at my kids for a second. <laughs> I'm not going to lie, I was mad for a second. I get frustrated with how ungrateful my kids are sometimes. Yep. Yeah. And that's my fault, and it's your fault. I mean, we, we allow them to be that way sometimes, or we give, 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 and they don't appreciate it, and that gets frustrating. But uh, I'm telling you tonight... What you need to understand is no matter what you don't have here tonight or no matter how uh, rough it is making ends meet this and that, you're still the wealthiest person in this county Amen. over people that's got billions of dollars in the bank and ain't got Jesus for, for to save their soul. you got way more than they ever got. Amen. Amen. And you are rich. You, you, you're like, well, Mike Blanton said, you're king's kids tonight. Amen. You're joint heirs 
to the creator of the heavens and the earth tonight. Amen. He went up to heaven to prepare what? Mansion. We walk on streets of gold. You understand? I had a guy one time tell me, he said, well, I, I don't get how God talks about money, the love of money being the root of all. And you, you hear all these loudmouth jack wagons that ain't got a clue what the book says. They just pick something and run with it. Uh, love of money is the root of all evil. We're not supposed to lust after that stuff. But then we go to heaven and it's streets of gold. I said, yeah, think about it for a minute, John boy. I said, we're trotting underfoot what man holds down here to be something to be sought after in high esteem. Yep, that's right. The streets are made of gold. We trod that underfoot, brethren. It don't mean nothing to us. Now it's going to be beautiful. It's going to be pretty. The jasper, all that. I'm aware of that. But you're rich tonight if you're saved. Amen. And you got to remember that. No matter how bad it gets, no matter how rough it gets, no matter how bad you think you ain't going to make it to the next check, and this and that, maybe I'm just preaching to myself tonight. I'm still the wealthiest man in Polk County compared to all the ones that's, that's got more right. money and they know what to that's do with. Right. But they're going to hell when they die. I've got I got more than I can ever need. Amen. Amen. And God, I, I'm telling y'all, you know, it's hard to do. I'm aware. We're learning. We we're, we're we're doing what's called growing in faith every day, right? We're we're climbing that ladder of sanctification, and we're trying to not be like the disciples. Oh, you little faith. I'm aware of that. But brethren, I'm telling you from firsthand experience, I've seen God stretch a dollar further than I ever knew one could be stretched without Amen. it tearing in half. Amen. Amen. But you want to know what it took? Me giving Amen. what I was supposed to do. Amen. Right. Yes. So don't come to me if you ain't giving to God and say, my finances are a wreck. That's going to be the first place your pastor is going to say, here's a good indication why. Yep. Right. I still believe in tithing. I still believe Amen. in the blessed fact that God blesses those that do what he calls them to do Amen. in terms of if you give what you're supposed to give, God will make the rest, he'll make the ends meet. Yep. Amen. Amen. I, I believe that tonight. There's a lot of people don't, and it's because they've been uh, living how they want and spending what they want and doing what they want, and God just says, there you go, have at it. You don't give an account for it one day anyway. It don't matter. But I've seen people's finances getting wrecked in a wreck, and they ain't thankful to God with nothing they've got. I fell at it. You fell at it. But I'm telling you, I've seen firsthand what God does when you do what you're supposed to do. Yep. Amen. 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 I got three of you to agree with. We must be doing all right tonight. <laughs> he says in verse 10, and here's where we look at the relation of grace to giving. And herein I give my advice. Now, Paul says he's giving his advice. Everybody okay with that? Yeah. Okay. For this is expedient for you who have begun before not only to do, but also to be forward a year ago. Now, therefore, perform the doing of it, that, that as there was a readiness to will, so there may be a performance also of that which you have. So you've got a will to do it. He says there's got to be a performance also out of that which you have. So what you've got, you've got to do something with it. Right. For if there be first a willing mind, it is accepted according that a man hath, and this is a big verse, and not according to that he hath not. Everybody get that? Yep. He says, for, you need to listen, for there must be, for there, or for if there be first a willing mind, so that tells you what you've got to have first, a willing mind. Mm -hmm. Everybody got that? Yep. Yep. It is accepted. If you've got a willing mind, it is, it is accepted according to that a man hath, and not according to to that he hath not. And so uh, here, here's where I've got a note down. I'm going to also give you this too. This verse is a key for Christian. Finding the will of God and should be memorized. God tests a Christian on what he is willing to do. That is where the Gethsemane, Gethsemane enters the Christian's life. The Christian's response to that determines the course of his life. So it's like this. Uh, if a Christian is willing... God will accept it even if that person is not able to do it. We, we always hear that saying, God doesn't uh, call the qualified, he qualifies the called, or he doesn't equip, uh, God doesn't call the equipped, he equips the called, that kind mm -hmm. of concept. That's sort of the same thought tonight. Yeah. Paul said you first have to be what? Willing. 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 That means you've got to be willing to do it. Sort of like that whole flip-flop that, if a man won't work, he shouldn't meet. You've got to be willing to do something in the first place before God's going to do what you need to have done in your life. Yeah. Right. I believe that. I believe a man should work tonight. Everybody better amen, amen. I believe a man should get up and work and provide for his family. I believe if you have to have two incomes, then you both got to work, then that's what you need to do. Whatever you got to do to provide for your family, to stay afloat, to pay your debts, because we are called to pay our debts. Yep. As right. much as I hate paying them, y'all didn't amen that, so you agree with me. <laughs> but that's what we ought to do. Amen. Yep. Right. But you got to have a willing mind. Now we're dealing with giving in terms of the Lord, giving whether it be financially, giving, giving whether it be service. 
You need to be willing to do that. You know people's problem tonight? They ain't willing. They don't want to do it. Getting quiet in here. Amen. People, let, let me tell you what people want. They want the blessings of God, but they don't have the willingness to go and do what it takes in order for God to bless. Most Amen. Of the time, you know? Amen. Now, some of this sounds like borderline prosperity, but y'all know me well enough to know better and not understand what I'm preaching and teaching. Right. I'm telling you tonight, people's problem is they ain't willing. Yep. They're willing. It, it, I, I'll give you this one. Danny Castle said this a long time ago, and I've never forgot this. Probably one of the first sermons I ever heard him preach. He said, people want a good Bible-believing, shouting church where people are getting saved and all this stuff's happening, God's moving, and there's great revival. People all want that, but there's nobody willing to pay the price for it. That's right. right. What it takes to get that. People fasting, people praying, people being serious, people attending and being faithful in their attendance, right, people yeah, tithing yeah. and being faithful in their tithing. People aren't willing to do that kind of stuff to get the outcome that they want. Right. And he said, you know what y'all's problem is? And I'm not, that's what he said to his congregation. So I don't think I'm telling you this. He said, what your problem is? He said, y'all love that, but you ain't willing to pay no price for it. He said, y'all just want to come in and soak up the blessings off everyone else's labor. Yeah, that's right. And that's a lot of Christians yeah. tonight. Yeah. They don't want to pay the price, but when it's happening, they want to show up and soak up the blessings of what happens. Amen and amen. amen. Now, I can tell you the best way to avoid that. Get willing, get in, serve, do what you're called to do, get your feelings off your shoulders, and just serve God. That's all you got to do tonight. Amen. It, it, it is so simple to serve God and to be a Christian tonight, and we complicate it 40 to 1,000 times more than it needs to be all the time. All right. yep. Amen. Well, someone's all looked at me funny, and I don't like this, and I'm mad at that, and I this, and I that. God ain't interested in none of that tonight. Right. What God's interested in is are you doing what you're supposed to do as a Christian? That's yeah. right. Go ahead, brother. Amen. Uh, I heard it said that, you know, God ain't going to get on no donkey he can't lead. Absolutely. <laughs> I like that term donkey, too. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and that's the way it is. I mean, he can't lead. You've got to be willing. I, I, I believe in the free will of man, correct? Yes. Right. God's a gentleman. He doesn't push himself on us. That's right. He wants us to be willing. Right. And that's what Paul says. First, if, for if there be first a willing mind, it is accepted according to that a man hath, and not according to the... Mm -hmm. For that he hath not. So here's here's the gist of it now. God ain't interested in what you ain't got. He's interested in whether you're willing to do it if he gives you the, the ability to do it. That's right. If a Christian is willing, God will accept it even if that person is not able to do it. You need to remember that. The last place I ever wanted to be when I got saved was behind a pulpit. In front of people. Talking trying to teach a Bible and preach a Bible that I had not a blessed clue about. I still don't claim to know much about it, but I'm telling you, that was the last place I wanted to be. But here's all I know. As I begin to feel like God was telling me I need to get up and I need to say something, I need to do something, I need to do something, and I need to say something and this and that, him, but you know what I'm talking about. And, and I just said, all right, Lord, if that's what you want, I'll do it. And here I am. Just got to be willing. That's yeah. all it took. It, I got no brains. I'm not an intelligent man at all. I can assure you. I don't. I don't know very much about anything. I'm not. I'm not good to look at. I'm not a good talker. I haven't been to college. I don't have degrees. All the stuff the world looks for when they look for somebody like me. I've got none of it. But what I do have is the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And what it took was me to be willing and say, "Okay, Lord, I'll do it. Right. Count me in. Sign me up. Whatever it takes. I'm in." Amen. Right. And then when you get in, you got to be faithful to that. Because right. I see people that get all hot and take off on something, but then they don't want to keep up their end of the deal, and God just puts them on a shelf. Done. Amen? Amen. Like, I feel bad when I miss service Sunday. Right. That bothers me. Yep. Amen? Amen? Amen. Some of y'all don't feel bad about missing church? I feel bad when I have to miss it. Even though I'm sick and I got a legitimate excuse, I don't want to come up for a chance getting somebody else sick. Or like me and Brother Gary was talking, there's only one bathroom here. I'm not playing games. <laughs> I ain't taking chances. Amen. And so here's what here's what it boils down to. I feel bad. I don't know how these these, these new agers will just sit at home and watch it live and sip our, our frat pays on the couch and we'll watch it live. There's something wrong with them people. Yeah, right. Amen. Mm -hmm. I don't Amen. get it. That's right. I even commented, I'd like to have been sitting here listening to Brother Gary's message Sunday morning, been back here Sunday night listening to Brother Charlie's message, been at the nursing home listening to Brother... I, I'd rather be there in person for that. Amen. Right. Amen. Now, when you're sick or you got where you, you just can't get far from the house, I'm going to be nice tonight and I'm going to dip, but you're, you're in a situation where you can't do much, I understand that. God understands that. Yeah, right. You know what I'm preaching about. Yeah. 
the people that can be, but they're not willing to be. Yeah. And they say, I wonder why, oh, woe is me. Why is this happening? Why is this? I don't know. I don't hear God say anything anymore. It's because you ain't willing to do nothing for him. Right. Unless, unless, unless it's convenient for you. Yeah. Right. And I'm going to tell you something about the service of God. Very seldom, in my experience, is it convenient to us. That's right. That's right. It takes sacrifice. Amen. That's right. You want something done? A lot of times you've got to do it yourself. Right. right. And you need to get that attitude when you start serving God. Yep. Amen. That'll help you not get mad at people when they don't do what you think they ought to do. Because chances are they think you ought to be doing something too and you ain't doing it. Right. That just goes round and round and round and round. I try to help y'all. Yeah. Yeah. We're real quick to notice what everyone else is not doing and forget about what we're not doing. That's right. You know? right. Michael Jagoff said that lady, that lady came to him and complained about that Sunday school teacher. Uh, he had over one, some of the kids, some lady, complain, I don't like the way she does this. I don't like this. I don't like that. I don't like Jack. I was looked at her and said, I like the way she's doing it better than the way you're not doing it. Hey, a lot of truth for that. Amen. Yeah. Amen. It'll take nothing to do this, brethren. That's right. right. That takes no intellect. That takes nothing. That takes no spirituality. It takes nothing. What does take the grace and move of God is saying, I'm going to get in and do it, even though I don't have a blessing clue half the time when I'm doing it. I'm running by the seat of my britches, and I don't know this, and I don't know that, and I ain't got no education, I ain't got this, I ain't got that. God will give it to you if you're willing, is what I'm telling you tonight. Amen. 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 That's right. And he says in 13, For I may not that other men be eased and ye burdened, but by an equality, that now at this time your abundance may be a supply for their want, that their abundance also may be a supply for your want, that there may be equality. As it is written, he that had gathered much had nothing over, and he that had gathered little had no lack. You ought to know that quote if you ever read that scripture, if you read Exodus. That's when the manna came down from heaven. God told him to gather it, and that, that verse 15 is the verbatim uh, quote out of that. Uh, I know I know you can't you can't copy uh, a text and, and from one language to another and it still be inspired, but that's exactly what uh, the Apostle Paul did here. Amen. For those of you who need to know that. Old Testament was written in what? Hebrew. New Testament written in Greek. You get that tonight? So when Paul took something out of the Old Testament, he's writing in Greek. He, he quotes something out of Hebrew and puts it in Greek. And it's still the inspired word of God. Amen. 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 That's very much true with the King James Bible. Now listen to me. Uh, Luke 14, that's the only time you really read much about equality uh, when dealing with God. Uh, for I mean, or but by inequality, that now at this time, your abundance may be a supply for their want, their abundance may be a supply for your want. The disciples didn't go around shouting for civil rights and equality. They just wanted to preach the gospel. You want equality, right? Here it is. You give what you can with what God's given you. And if you're doing what you ought to be doing over here on this side, you're giving what God's given you and doing what you can with it, and it makes an even balance for everybody. Right. Yeah. You remember the book, the, the book of Acts? Uh, there in the beginning, first four chapters roughly, um, everyone took that which they had, sold it, and they just put everything together, and they just gave each man as he needed. That's that, that equality he's talking about. Just whatever you can do, give it and help. And guess what? If people do what they're supposed to do over here, they give and they help, and it's an even balance. Amen. Amen. That, that that's kind of like uh, you know, you, I, I see the loss. I mean, I understand people are lost, but sometimes you all pray for me. It, it kills me when people don't know nothing about the Bible. Then they try to speak to it. Number one, you always see this. Well, money's the root of all evil. I, I mean, you ever see anyone quote that? You'll see me immediately. That's the only time I get on Facebook war with anybody. That's a wrong quotation of the scripture, number one. Money is not the root of all evil. The love of money is the root of all evil. Right. That's right. Money is an inanimate object. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have the ability to be evil. But people's love for it and their desire burning towards it, it causes a lot of evil. Almost right. about 99.9% .9 of sins you find in America can all be traced back to the love of money. Amen. In case you were wondering. But they always say, say if money is the root of all evil, then why do churches ask for it every Sunday? Well, hey, stupid, who do you think pays the light bill here? You think one person ought to do that? Or would it make more sense for everyone to tithe and pitch in and all the burden yeah. be carried out equally? Yeah. Right. That's this equality concept we're talking about tonight. Mm -hmm. Amen? Amen. Now, like I said, pray for me to get more grace for that stuff, but it wears <laughs> me out sometimes. It don't take much of a brain to figure out that one person can't assume all the financial burden of a church building. 
Amen. 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 Almost like God set up tithing for a reason so it can be spread out evenly yeah, and right. everyone can bear the burden. And yes, you're going to have people that don't do a blessed fire thing. Nothing for God. They don't give nothing. They just stingy as all get out. They sing through their false teeth or sing through their nose to keep from wearing their false teeth out. That kind of stingy. Yeah, you're going to find people like that. Right. But God always makes up where people lack. That's right. Verse 16, but thanks be to God, which put the same earnest care into the heart of Titus for you. For indeed he accepted the exhortation, uh, but being more forward of his own accord, he went unto you. And we have sent with him the brother whose praise is in the gospel throughout all the churches. This is Paul commending Titus to the Corinthians, letting them know about Titus. And not that only, but who was also chosen of the churches to travel with us with this grace, which is administered to us by the glory of the same Lord and declaration of your ready mind, avoiding this, that no man should blame us in this abundance which is administered by us. Paul very concerned with not being blamed by people for mishandling or misusing the things of God. You think a lot of the American church today is worried about that? You, you, think, you think Kenneth Copeland is worried about giving an account one day for their private jet they bought off Tyler Perry? When there's people in the town they live in that's probably starving to death. Amen. 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 You, you, you ever think old Joel old Osteen's going to answer for that time the hurricane came through down there? And until the media finally got contacted and came in, he was going to leave that Lakewood church, the door shut to those that were trying to find a place to flee and find refuge while they were about to lose everything they had. You think God ain't going to have something to say about that? That's right. That's right. Starts getting deep when you peel it back, don't it? Woo. You think God ain't going to have something to say to these wet job charismatics? Like I was talking about before, prayer request service. I don't know how many of you saw that preacher from Richmond, uh, Missouri, or Richland, Missouri, telling, telling parents their kids are demon-possessed if they're autistic. Yeah. <gasps> Greg Locke did that too. Yeah. You think God ain't going to have something to say about that kind of stuff? Yeah. Mishandling, misusing the things he's given us? He's given us a word, so we ain't got to make stupid mistakes like that. Right. Amen. Amen. But the problem is he told us to rightly divide the word of truth and no one cares. They don't want to do it. They just want to take it at face value and just run with it and do the whole entire denominations. Yeah. Right. And then you get idiots to stand behind the pulpit and tell mamas and daddies that's dealing with everything they can at their wits end probably. Dealing with their child that's got a, a disability like that. Telling that child's got devils. Yeah. yeah. You're crippled too high for crutches, dummy. Yeah. yeah. Amen. You don't know what your book says. That's yeah. right. I'd probably just go ahead and get off the pulpit, get out from behind it, and I'd go sit out there and let someone teach me for a while if I was really that stupid That's to believe right. that. Right. Right. See, I try to be nice, but I get tired of it sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> There's no call to be that stupid. There's no reason to be that dumb. All it takes is picking it up, a willing mind, yeah. studying to show that self approved, and God will teach you things. Now, yeah, when you first get called to preach, you're going to say some things probably that are all goofy and jacked up and who knows what else, but that, that God shows you real quick that kind of stuff. These men have been preaching for years and ain't got enough sense to know the difference. Shame on me. Providing for honest things, not only in the sight of the Lord, but also in the sight of men. See, Paul said we need to provide for honest things, not just in the sight of the Lord, but in the sight of men. You're going to have false, uh, false accusers. You ain't going to get around that. You, you ain't going to preach and stand behind this book. You ain't going to preach about sin. You ain't going to preach about all the sexual sins and all this stuff. You ain't going to preach like that and not make enemies. That's right. But we are still to do what God's called us to do and try to be honest in things, not only in the sight of the Lord, but in the sight of men. How many people you know that's had a bad run-in with a crooked preacher and that was their way out of church? Yeah. That's why I try not to do business with people in church. I don't even like seeing people in the church do business deals. Personally. Amen. Amen. Now, I ain't telling you what you can and can't do. I'm just saying I don't like to see that very often. I've seen it blow up and go south in a hurry. And we have sent with them our brother, whom we have oftentimes proved diligent in many things, but now much more diligent upon the great confidence which I have in you. Whether any do inquire of Titus, he is my partner and fellow helper concerning you, or our brethren be inquired of, they are the messengers of the churches and the glory of Christ, 
Wherefore, show ye to them and before the churches the proof of your love and of our boasting on your behalf. So Paul's really commending them here. He's saying, listen, Titus is coming. He's good. The brethren coming. They're good. Everything's good. He said, you, but when they get there, you need to show to them and before the churches the proof of your love and of our boast. Paul said, I've been running around bragging on y'all. And he says, you need to show them why. Amen? Amen. You need to prove that stuff. Uh, oh, yeah. I got time for nine? Yeah. Oh, we got 30 minutes. For as touching the ministering to the saints, it is superfluous for me to write to you. Here, let's do this while we got time. Who's got the 1828 app? I've been telling you I'll do this. Oh, yeah. Oh, else got it. oh Jeremy, you're probably going to race. I like seeing this. He's got the quick fingers. I got it. Oh, look at that. We're trying to get that superfluous of goo for uh, a Noah Webster. This is what you do when you study, church. You don't know a word, you go find out what it means. Uh, more than is wanted, rendered unnecessary by the superabundance, as a superfluous supply of corn, more than sufficient, unnecessary, useless, as a composition abounding with superfluous words. You're saying what? You want to take a guess? It's superfluous for me to write to you. Useless. useless. There's really not any point in what I'm going to tell you, but I'm going to do it anyway. Yeah. I know how you feel, Brother Paul. Y'all heard it enough, but I'm going to tell you anyway. Amen. Amen. For I know the forwardness of your mind, for which I boast of you to them of Macedonia and Achaia, was ready a year ago, and your zeal hath provoked many. Now, that's a good thought to hang on there, too. Does your zeal provoke people? Your zeal for the Lord. That's a good question. Does my zeal for the Lord provoke other people to want to do stuff for the Lord? Does my zeal for the Lord provoke people to want to know more about the Lord that are lost? Getting quiet. I got quiet too when I was reading over this. Does my zeal provoke anybody? Do people, do people ever look at, at what I try to do for the Lord, not in terms of me, but my, he says your zeal. Do people ever look at anything I do for the Lord and think, man, that makes me want to do more for the Lord. That makes me want to study my Bible harder. That makes me want to hand out a track. That makes me want to do something. That, or the big one, that makes me want to be saved. That makes me want to know about the Lord Jesus Christ. If he can do that in that person, look at that zeal they've got. Does your zeal provoke people? I can't answer for you. I can't. The only person I can answer for is myself. And I'll be honest with you, I don't know that my zeal ever provokes anybody. And you probably never will for the most part. But you should be having a kind of zeal that would provoke people. Amen. Amen. Yet have I sent the brethren, lest our boasting of you should be in vain on, in this behalf, that as I said, you may be ready. You need to be ready. Church. You got to be ready in all kinds of things. But here Paul says, I sent the brethren, lest our boasting of you should be in vain in this behalf, that as I said, you may be ready, lest happily, if they of Macedonia come with me and find you unprepared, we, that we say not ye, should be ashamed in this same confident boasting. I, I just want to give you this one word, and, and, and I understand the, the strong focal point here of this, but that term unprepared, that's a big one. In all things in terms of God. We need to be prepared. Everybody okay with that? Yep. Yes. that that's why I, I was getting convicted over the music stuff. We wasn't as prepared as we should be. I get convicted over my own stuff and being more prepared for my sermons, being more prepared for Wednesday nights. We are Heaven is a prepared place for a prepared people. Yep. And we need to be prepared in everything we do down here and be ready. We've got to make effort. And you've got to be, what did Paul tell us last chapter? Willing. To be prepared means you have a willing mind. That's why I prayed in the prayer meeting and, and prayer meeting tonight and said, let, let us prepare Saturday night for Sunday morning. Amen. Let us be ready for it. Amen and amen. amen. Be prepared. And what's he talking about here? I, I mean, if we look at this, I, I'm, I'm pulling way back and, and using this sort of as a, as a blanket thought. But he said, if they, that means other people, find you unprepared. Can, can you know the ways you can apply this tonight if you really wanted to just start sticking it in places? Always be ready to give an answer for the reason of the hope that is in you. Yeah. Being prepared yeah. in your scripture. Yeah. Instant, in season, and out of season. Mm -hmm. Being prepared. Right. Christians are supposed to be a prepared people. Yeah. I preached last Wednesday night on the second coming of Christ because we are, we are to prepare for that. Right. We're to be looking for that. We're to be ready for that. We're to be watching for that. And we're to be trying to prepare other people for that. Yeah. Yeah. But a lot of people ain't doing that because they ain't prepared themselves. They ain't ready for nothing. They ain't even ready for church on Sunday morning. Amen. 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 Therefore, I thought it necessary to exhort the brethren that they would go before unto you and make up 
beforehand your bounty, whereof ye had noticed before that the same might be ready as a matter of bounty and not as covetousness. Um, you know, and that, that the first five verses there is dealing with ministering to the saints, ministering to one another. We, we don't we don't just witness; we also minister to one another. Miss Kay, you said that before, during prayer meeting. Yes. People in the church ministering to one another. Now, here's why I wanted to cover nine because Paul and this see this chapter is very short. There's only 15 verses. We're dealing with New Testament giving. We're back on the concept of giving, so I didn't want to drag into out two weeks on the concept of giving, but I. I'm going to hit it both while we're here. But this I say, and here's what I'm telling you, we was going to come into this. This I say, listen to this, he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly. And he which soweth bountifully, bountifully shall reap also bountifully. It doesn't get much clearer than that. Yeah. If you give sparingly, meaning not very much and very careful, and like I said, I know we got to be careful with God's money, but listen, he's talking about being a type one. If you want to give like that, that's how you're going to reap in life. Yeah. But if you want to give in a bountiful manner, then you're going to reap bountiful. That's one of them. That, that, there's your prosperity message that you can legitimately find in the gospel, and it comes to nothing to do with yourself. Yeah. It talks about blessing others. Amen. Right. Now, you can be a wicked flesh pot, and you can say, okay, well, I'm going to give a bunch, so maybe I'll get a bunch back. That's not what God's telling you to do here. He's saying you need to give, and I'll, I'll show you where he's telling you that. Even every man according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give not grudgingly, nor of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. Amen. That's how I can tell you, you can't flip that around and say, well, I'm going to give a bunch, because then I might, that, that's not what, that's not being a cheerful giver. Right. That's you trying to put your own stinking desire and wants in it and get something out of it in return. Right. Okay. And that's not what you're to do. You're to give cheerfully. Amen. Amen. I, I, I don't know anybody in here struggles with this, but if I couldn't give to the church I was a part of cheerfully, I probably wouldn't sit there very long. That's right. Just telling you. I enjoy tithing what I work, work out here in the real world. I enjoy giving that to this church. Amen. Because I know I, my hustle gets some of that. Amen. Amen. I know people that genuinely need help from time to time with a water bill or a light bill or groceries. They get that. I know what this church stands for and stands on and stands behind. I don't mind giving money to it. Yes, I tithe. In case you're wondering, Pastor tithe. Amen. Everyone should tithe. But I'm telling you right now, if I was sitting somewhere where I didn't, I wanted to be sparingly and not really help out nothing, I don't know why you're even there. You don't love it enough to try to keep it further. Why are you even doing that? Amen. I'm just being honest tonight, church. If that's you, I have no idea. I don't know what people give. I don't care to know what people give. It does not matter to me what people give. I don't pay attention. I don't look. I don't do none of that because I don't want to know nothing. But I'm telling you from a personal experience, if I sit in a church that I cannot give cheerfully and give with a, a cheerful heart, a cheerful attitude, because I knew, hey, I know that money's going to be used for what it needs to be used for, not just keeping the lights on and paying the rent and all this other stuff we've got to deal with, but I know they give to a missionary that we can back. I know they get, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm all for more missionaries to support but it's going to take more giving. Yep. Amen. Yep. Amen. That's all it is. Simple mathematics. Amen? Amen. But he loveth a cheerful giver. Who loveth a cheerful giver? Paul told you. God. Amen. Yep. Amen. Don't give grudgingly. Don't give of necessity. Give because you want to give. Right. Give because you're happy about it. Amen? Amen. You, every time... Uh, well, here I am quoting him again. Danny Cousins said, people like this. I ain't going down to that church every time I go down there. All they want is money. And he said, yes, yeah, so does Walmart. And right. you keep going there religiously. Yeah. Right. You go there just to look for something to buy. Amen? Amen. Amen. I mean, that, that's just the reality of it. That is what it is. Right. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that ye always having all sufficiency, sufficiency in all things may abound to every good work. Uh, Ruckman believed this was the second greatest promise in the Bible for the Christian because it is conditioned on being a cheerful giver. You, you, you need to understand that promise there. This, this is where you, you grab context. Amen? Amen? He's dealing with being a cheerful giver and he immediately goes into verse 8 and says, And God is able to make all grace abound toward you that you always having all sufficiency in all things may abound to every good work. So we read things like verse 
9 or verse 8, we think, man, God's going to make all grace abound toward me. He's going to give me sufficiency in all things. And he's going to give me enough grace and all this stuff to make sure I abound in every good work. Well, you've got to back up there, Hoss, and see what he's telling you you've got to do in order for that to happen. Yes. Being a cheerful giver. Yes. You've got to give. Well, it's the old saying. You've got to give in order to receive. That's right. That's right. But you've got to do it cheerfully. Verse 9, as it is written, he hath dispersed abroad. He hath given to the poor. His righteousness remaineth forever. Now he that ministereth seed to the sower both minister bread for your food and multiply your seed sown and increase the fruits of your righteousness. Being enriched, here's the results of liberal giving, being enriched in everything to all bountifulness which causeth through us thanksgiving to God. Now I'm giving you this study note on cheerful giving because I like this. Cheerful giving accomplishes four things in verses 11 through 14. You're going to read the people who get money thank God for the money and for answered prayer. It supplies their needs for which they thank God. You'll find that in verse 12. It makes them pray for you more because you help them out in verse 14. It puts them under conviction if they are not living sanctified lives for they see the grace of God in your life, verse 13. There's four things being a cheerful giver accomplishes, and they're very important things. For the verse twelve, for the administration of this service not only supplieth the want of the saints, but is abundant also by many thanksgivings unto God. Many thanksgivings unto God. Whilst by the experiment of your administration, they glorify God for your professed subjection unto the gospel of Christ. There's God being glorified in verse thirteen, and for your liberal distribution unto them and unto all men, and by their prayer for you. There's you getting prayers, which long after. You, for the exceeding grace of God in you, thanks be unto God for his unspeakable gift. So there's your two chapters back to back dealing with Christian giving, whether it be um, giving, holding back, being very, you know, holding back and keeping back part and not doing what you should, whether it be giving cheerfully. There's your two chapters back to back on giving. Like I said, there's a lot of, I mean, there's a lot of preachers love preaching on giving because they got something to make out of it. Hey, man. I ain't here for your money. I know preachers say that, but you got one, Jim. I don't need your money. I work myself and make my own way. Always did before I got saved, and I reckon I always will after I get saved. But we are called as Christians to be givers. Right. Amen. And sometimes, yes, that includes our service. Mm -hmm. yes. yes. I, I, I keep bragging on it, but our tent revival, I couldn't ask for more giving and more help. I couldn't. We had men out there swinging mallets. We had women in here doing all the nine kinds of things, stuff I don't even know. I wasn't about to walk in here. But there was all kinds of stuff being done. That's you giving as well. That's right. Giving your time, giving effort. You may, maybe giving a talent, something you've got. Some of you men out there were better aims with that mallet than I was. That's a, that's a talent, whether you like thinking or not. You're giving something. Right. Amen? Amen. 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 So we got time. Yeah, I got, got I'm going to get to it now. Now I'm going to go a whole different subject tonight real quick. Anyone in here ever heard of the law of first mention? Raise your hand. Law of first mention. Charlie, a little bit? It sounds familiar. Uh, the law of first mention, and, and, and listen, I, I don't know why I'm giving you this, but this is something God had showed me a couple weeks ago, and I've just been thinking about it, thinking about it, thinking about it, and I'll tell you what the law of first mention is. But you take people that are in modern versions, they don't like the law of first mention. They say that it's uh, not a way to... Uh, apply the scriptures or anything of that nature. And I'll tell you what the law of first mention is here. The law of first mention, in generality, it states that the first time a word appears in the scripture, how that word is used sets the tone or associations and basic meanings of the word throughout the rest of scripture. Everybody following so far? The first time you see that word in scripture, that usually sets the tone or the pace for how you see it used throughout the rest of the scriptures. Law of first mention. That word's definition may be clarified, extended, contrasted, or qualified, but that original meaning will run throughout the entire book. And the one I'm going to give you now, I'm just trying to show you modern perversions versus King James Version, and I figured most of you probably had not heard of law of first mention, but it's like this. It's like the first time you run into the word, say you're reading a book, and I don't work with any book. Your Bible. You, you, you run into the word sin. The first time the word sin appears, which I have it here, Genesis 4, 7. From then on out, every time you run into the word sin, you find it 
is the same sort of tone, the same sort of pace, the same sort of meaning, same sort of contrast, all that. And like it says here, the word's definition may may be clarified, extended contrast, or above. It may even go even deeper. This Bible will it has its own built-in dictionary. If you didn't know that, amen. amen? Okay, here's the law of first mention, and, 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 and here's what I wanted to get, give you tonight, because like I said, God showed this to me a couple weeks ago uh, through a podcast I was listening to. Uh, I knew about law of first mention from the King James standpoint, but I began to study after I heard what I heard and pay attention, and yes, the, the, new, the new age Christians, they don't like the law of first mention, they think it's goofy, they think it's stupid. And I'm going to show you why tonight. Now, uh, we're going to do it off the, the biggest word in the Bible, especially the one they like the most. The word love. Does anyone know where the word love first appears in your King James Bible? It's Genesis 22, 2. I want someone to do me a favor and flip over there to Genesis 22, 2 and see why law first mention is kind of neat and it is relatively important when studying your Bible. It helps give you some background and some understanding of words and, and things. Now, you won't find this to be true with every single word, but big words, sin, love, miracles, blood, prophet, things of that nature, that's what we're talking about. Big, big, important words. <laughs> Who's in Genesis 22 to? Charlie, I've seen your hand first. What do you got there? And he said, and he said, take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and give thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell thee of. Brethren, that's the first mention of love in your Bible. Did you see what it's in reference to? Take thine only son, whom thou lovest, and go offer him. Do you get where I'm going with this tonight? I'm getting Holy Ghost chills telling you this. Surely that goodness, somebody's getting this tonight. Amen. Tell me that law first mention don't work when it's setting the precedent for the word love. Yeah. Right. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Right. God loved his son, but he sacrificed him for sin. Yeah. Yep. And the first time you find the word love mentioned in your King James Bible, it's to Abraham in terms of giving his only son, that was his promised son. Amen? Amen. Amen. Now, now here's what I want you to do. You're going to take your phone unless someone in here for some reason has an NIV and so you better not. <laughs> no, I don't care if someone brings one in here, but it would just probably be awkward. Uh, who's, got a, who's got an NIV uh, or a phone they can use here? All right. So here, here's another good, useful tool. Blue Letter Bible. This is fun. You can search a word. It'll tell you how many times it's in the Old Testament, the New Testament, the entire Bible. I mean, you can do all kinds of things on it. It's fun. Saves you a lot of counting if you're like me and you're horrible at math. So what I'm going to do is, and I'm showing you, I'm going to type in the word love, and I'm going to search it. Now, it tells me in the King James Bible where it's at. First mention, right there. Or love if, I'm sorry. Because that's love. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I type in love if. Oh, Where's that at, Charlie? 22 2? Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What was the word? Love is? Okay. That's the first time you will see love, period. If you just type in love, it'll take you way on past Genesis. You type in love is, it takes you like three chapters past. So there's love is. There it is, Genesis 22. Take thine. Now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest. Now, what I'm going to do here, because you don't find words like lovest or loveth in the NIV, amen? Mm -hmm. so I've been love, <laughs> not live. Love, not live. You're about to see your preacher throw a phone in. <laughs> if you don't have fat thumbs, you don't know the struggle. Amen. All right, so I typed in love. I go over here to the King James section, NIV. Search it again. Oh, I'm talking a big game tonight. But, uh, there you go. Do you want my phone? There it is. Okay. I, I got it to work. Love in the NIV. The first mention of love in the NIV is Genesis 4.1. So someone go get Genesis 4.1 for me in the NIV. This may not mean nothing to you, but I find it to be rather interesting. Does modernists don't like 
law first mentioned, they think it's stupid and goofy. Now, what's that verse say, Sandy? Go ahead and read it, it verbatim. Adam made love to his wife Eve, and she became pregnant and gave birth to Cain. She said, with the help of the Lord, I have brought forth a man. So Adam made love to his wife Eve. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm going to say, number one, I'm not a fond of that wording, a, a fan of that wording. Yeah. I'd hate for one of y'all ladies to be in here teaching these young in Sunday school. You hear what I'm saying? Yeah, right. And Adam made love. Now, us King, Jamer, King Jamesers, we know what is knew his wife. They knew each other. Right. Yeah. There's some coof there. Yeah, right. Amen. 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 But the NIV says they made love together. Now you, but, but what I'm giving you tonight is the law of first mention. Now, do you understand why these people can't get their bearings with the Bible? Well, law of first mention don't work. Yeah, because your law of first mention is, is sexually related. Mm -hmm. Our law of first mention is what you and I is blessed by and under tonight, and that's the sacrifice of someone's only begotten son. Amen. Amen. And that's a big deal to me. It may not be to you, but I thought, how interesting is that? And then I never even knew that verse was in the NIV that they'd made it to made love. I prefer, as a gentleman, it to say they knew each other Amen. or yeah. conceived, right? What was that verse, Sandy? Genesis 4, 1? Yeah, 4, 1. Yeah, let me get back there. And then I, was, I, I got curious. So I looked up the word love in the King James Version. And the first time love is mentioned in the King James is Genesis 27, 4. That, the word love. Love. Itself. But if you look up love is or love is. Love itself, like the NIV used yeah. in the King James Version. It's, and make me a savory meat such as I love, and bring it to me that I may eat, that my soul may be blessed before I die. Mm, that works too, a Christian eating the word of God. Something mm. that feeds us. Yeah, uh, for us King James people, chapter 4, verse 1, and Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived. Yeah. Yeah. So a little more appropriate to me. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I want nothing to do that, I mean. You understand why I call them perversions, not just because they pervert the word, but they also get a little more perverted in description, too. Right. Yeah. Honestly, guys. But I'm telling you, the, the law of first mention stuff, that's that's fun if you get time to go do. I mean, I, I got a whole appendix back here with something that you can just run with. I've got love, heart, believed, armies, man of God, work of God, ghost, my people, prayer, the day of the Lord, sin, angel, devils, salvation, blood, prophet, holy, scripture, wine, miracle, hell, faith, preach, eternal, sinners, kiss, and worship. I mean, those are just some words you can run into. Law yep. of first mention. Bam, you can look there. Oh, there it is. And then when you come across it, a lot of times you'll find it be the precedent for that word throughout the entire Bible. Mm -hmm. In a godly higher matter. Ma ma right. Just like love. Abraham, take your only son whom you love and sacrifice him. Mm -hmm. God loved his only son and he sent him for a sacrifice. Right. It, it's a really a fun study, but I wanted to try to give you that maybe to arouse your interest a little bit and say, hey man, I kind of like to maybe look into some of that all first mentioned stuff just to, something to do, man. Just something fun to look at and do, but I also wanted to see just how sick and twisted the NIV is. Right. I never knew that was in there. But, uh, that's probably because I don't spend time in one either, so. <laughs> but nevertheless, uh, you think a book that was written by men, boy, they got some lucky jabs in there, didn't they? On that King James. I mean, they got some lucky jabs. You want one more? I got time to give you one more? Yeah, go ahead. You know what? You want to know what the center chapter of your Bible is? Who knows it? The center chapter of the Bible? Um, Psalms 119. Close. Gary, what you got? Um, Psalms 118 in it. The center two words. You don't get there. I'm <laughs> messing up yet. <laughs> I'm not making this up. You can go double check me. If you want to go count all the verses out yourself, you can go do it. Come on, Bonds. Oh, let me see here. <laughs> verse 9. Psalms 118. You know what the center verse is? Or the center chapter. I'm probably saying this wrong. Let me get my wordings right here. It's the based off the word count. It's about, it's, this is based off the word count, the verse count, and chapter count. 
So the center chapter is 118. That makes the center verse, uh, verse, what did I say? Nine. Okay, is anyone looking at it? So now I'm giving you the center verse in the entire King James Bible. Chapter 118. Anybody there? You said Why don't we just read it? Psalms 118, verse 9. The center verse of your Bible is, it is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. Charlie's there looking at it. Just so you know the same you pulled your leg. Charlie, how many words are in that verse? Fourteen. So can he take one center word out of that verse, or does he have to get two words? Two. He's got to get two words, right? You can't pick a center first. So that leaves you with how many on each side to get two center words to make sure we're math right. One, two, three, four, five, six. If you do six on one side, that leaves you. If you do two center words, one, two, three, four, five. One. I'm sorry. One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay. So you have to go down to two center words. Is everybody following me tonight, or am I getting like real gibbery speaking? Psalms 118, verse 9 is the center verse in your Bible. Everybody got that much? Yeah. Yep. The verse says it is better to put it is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in the man. In the, the, yeah. Verse 8. I keep saying 9, it's verse 8. <laughs> I was say, verse 9 says princes. Yeah, I was about to say princes, yeah. Is See, now I'm you guys all lost. <laughs> verse 8. Okay. Verse 8 is the center verse. And that verse has how many words? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. Yep. Can you get one center word out of 14, or do you got to get two center words? Okay. Two. That leaves you with how many on each side? Six. six. So, Brother Charlie, if you go six words forward and six words backwards from that, what are the center two words of the center verse of the center chapter in the center book of the Bible, or the center verse of the Bible? The Lord. The Lord. Yeah. That means the Lord is the center two words of this book. Boy, the King James translators sure took a shot in the dark and lucked out, didn't they? <laughs> Some of y'all ain't following me tonight. But... Well, and... and... He's the heart of the book. He's the author of the book. It's literally in a verse that says you need to put trust in man or put trust in the Lord rather than man. You know what all the scholars and all the new perversion Bibles do? They put trust in scholars and man rather than just trust in the Lord and his book. Right. I study. I don't know about you, but I study. I know what they do. Hey, Amen. Amen. They couldn't get a center like that. Yeah. They'd be off, they're missing chap they're miss, missing partial chapters they're missing multiple verses a lot of them don't even put the last several verses in the last chapter of Mark they, they couldn't even get nowhere near that now you see why they don't like when these old timey King James only preachers come up with things like law first mentioned or they come up with the center words of the Bible because they can't do that with their book because it's corrupted amen, amen. all right I'm gonna turn y'all loose I don't know if y'all getting it tonight even more Lord is all capital letters. Mm -hmm. which means Jesus in your Old Testament. Yes. Another good point, Brother Darren. Well, and it also says, every time it mentions the Lord, it says it's the Lord. Yeah. The Lord. What? Yeah, that's singular. There ain't no other Lords. Yeah. <laughs> Capital Lords. Yeah. There's many small Lords. Amen. Mm -hmm. Yep. All right, all mine's free for we dismiss. All right, Brother Ellis, you know what to do tonight. <laughs> Dear God, thank you for this night, Lord. Thank you through uh, talking through Pastor Stan, Lord, to preach to us, Lord, and pray for the ones that are lost, Lord. I uh, hope they uh, repent and come to you, Lord, and so live their own lives. And uh, I pray that we uh, use the any convention uh, convictions that you put upon our hearts, Lord, that we need to come to you more with gifting and what we need to do, Lord, through the Scripture. I love you, trust you, Jesus' name, amen. amen. amen.